So hello and welcome to everybody who's taken the opportunity to watch this, um, this talk. Um, I'm Michelle Bowen, I'm Director of UK New Artists. And I'd like to introduce you to my two talkies uh, and part of this presentation um, and um, ask them to introduce themselves. Garth. Hello, I'm Garth Gratrix. I am a artist and curator based in Blackpool in the Northwest, and I am acting as a director of Abingdon Studios, which has been running over the last seven years since I set that up here. Jarvis. Hello, my name is Jarvis Brookfield, and I am a self taught artist, and I live here in Leicester. And I've been painting for around three years, and um, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I just want to mention that we're very proud to be part of the Leicester Art Week programme of talks and events um, and to be able to kind of share this conversation um, about our new venture, which is called The Viewing Room, which is a digital gallery, which can be found through our website, but will also be um, a link at the end of this presentation. So, Jarvis, just going back to you, what is it? like being an artist in Leicester? I think Leicester's a brilliant small city with so much going on and um, there's a lot of brilliant artists here. There's um, a few great spaces which kind of foster a lot of creativity. There's a place called Studio Name um, and that's really like the hub of, um, you know, it kind of has a commercial vibe about it, you know, in kind of uh, showing work and selling work um, and on a kind of personal level I, thought, I heard a bit of feedback there on a personal level um, I think I, I'm quite a hermit kind of artist I just kind of create my work in my studio um, but I make sure to go out and see what's going on um, and I think there isn't so much going on that it's distracting, but it's just enough in that you keep in touch um, with with what's going on in the world, at least for myself. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I think Leicester is a is a brilliant little place in England for being an artist. So you feel nurtured by the city. I do, and you know, like I said, I can just stay in my studio for well, studios at my house, but I can stay. <laughs> weeks on end um so when something does pop up it is refreshing and uh, but there is lots of things going on as as we now know it's leicester art week um but even throughout the year there's you know studio name put stuff on lcb depot put stuff on um so it's great it's, it is really good unfortunately there hasn't been as much yeah. as yeah. i would have liked for the obvious without getting too much into that Without using the COVID word, I know, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about being kind of self-taught? Um, yeah, so I did study at university, um, but, I, you know, when I first started university, I was really passionate about learning about the technical um, principles that underlie picture making. Um, so I, I didn't really get that kind of teaching I was looking for, but I got taught um, many other great lessons about art history and you know research and documentation from university but um, the process of being self-taught is that you know I was kind of just looking for um, a one place in which I can find this information um, of you know how you know preparing surfaces and um, just because it's something which I didn't know about like three or four years ago. I didn't understand how um, somebody I, could make a painting, you know, and I wanted to learn about that. So it's just been a kind of um, a rocky path uh, to some extent where you're constantly going back to the beginning, remembering certain things. But, um, yeah, it's, you're always continuously learning, but I feel much more confident where I'm at now oh. than I was oh. a year or two years ago. We're going to be seeing some images of your work, but can you just talk us through kind of, you know, uh, 
your process, um, your inspiration, where the kind of imagery comes from, because it's a very individual voice that you have. It's a very specific kind of um, imagery, and I'm quite interested to know where that kind of derives from. Mm. So the basis of my work is drawing. Everything kind of emerges out of drawing. Drawing's really what connects me I feel connects me to my unconscious you know I'm interested in making works from my imagination um but when I started painting it was very much observing the world around me and taking in visual phenomena and understanding color and um form and shape and line but over the few years I've just become interested in creating works that really celebrate um the internal world of what it means to be human you know the the imagination and the unconscious and visionary states of consciousness um, are just, for me, like some of the most interesting things about what it means to be human. And it's just something which I feel is, is I think we're getting there, but it's been overlooked for such a long time um, that I just, yeah, it's such an exciting part of my work, really. Mm. No, I mean, as I said, it's a really unique voice that you have and your work really does stand out. Um, oh, and, uh, <clears throat> we're delighted to have it as part of the viewing room. Um, and just as we go on to that, because as I said, we've, you know, as UK New Artists, we've developed a new platform um, called the Viewing Room. Uh, we invited Garth Gratrix to come and um, curate this new digital platform, this new digital gallery. Um, Garth has worked with us over a number of different projects. So this is kind of one of a, of a nice line of work that, that we've done with Garth previously. Um, but I'm really kind of interested in, you know, Garth, you would have, um, I think I understand this is the first digital gallery you have curated. Um, and for obvious reasons, why we have a digital gallery in 2020. Um, but I'd love you to tell us a little bit more about kind of what was that like? How is it different to curating in real life? What were the things you had to consider? What were sort of things that you learnt along the way? The kind of obstacles, the positives, the negatives. Um, what was that journey from, you know, creating the viewing room like from a curatorial perspective? Yeah, I think for me it was a very interesting process as you say rightly it's my first digital kind of expedition in that sense and delving into the world of back-end processes and software to create a space as opposed to you walk art into a space and think about its installation so the bricks and mortar technically isn't there until you create it through coding and systems um, and that isn't a world that I exist in or nor, nor did I set out to exist in that world potentially um, but for me as an artist and a curator, particularly in the way that I work with you at UKNA, a lot of my passion is about trying to find ways to do large, ambitious exhibitions with a number of artists to, I guess, celebrate a real range and a diverse collection of works that are available through artists working in the UK today. So I was quite conscious in embarking on this particular show of how that is still representative of your ethos and still you know in that trusted organizational way of working with young artists emergent talent um, and how we do that in a way that you're not necessarily seeing the physical works i think in reality this this isn't a real space it's you, we're looking at real paintings but we're not actually seeing the real painting we're seeing a digital photograph of those paintings um or assemblage pieces or mixed media pieces so there is some real differences there. Um, there's something about how works in a collection are easy to navigate as well on a digital platform. So curatorially, my interests are quite installation and I like to take lots of different material and play with how they are playing off against one another. So almost taking an artist's intention and adding another intention because as a curator, you want to try and explore and challenge the works as well, rather than just show them as they are. Because I think that allows an artist each time that they show work to see their work differently, as well as an audience engage with those artists in a way that um, explores a diversity around their ideas. 
Um, so for me, I guess one of the not necessarily negatives, but realities of putting a digital show on is they're not as easy to navigate. You know, you're reliant on a computer, you're reliant on a mouse, you're reliant on connection. Um, and you can't necessarily dart across a gallery in the same way that you might be able to do on foot with a group of friends or in a, in a walk around experience with a curator and the artists. So in one sense, it connects you digitally wider in terms of when you think about audience, but in the other sense, you lose a level, or arguably you lose a level of intimacy um, in the way that you can kind of play with a space. So obviously when you look at the viewing room, you go around each artist's work and it's a collection of each works. So there's, a, I guess, a commercial presentation in that sense of mm -hmm. how you can easily understand each artist's intentions as opposed to maybe a curatorial intervention in that. Um, so it was very interesting in me to, uh, ironically, remove the formal needs of presenting work in an institution but then actually having to consider all the works very formally in you have to easily understand all the works by Jarvis. You have yeah. to easily understand all the works by the other <clears> artists. <throat> you have to have a very simple round the gallery flow um, just to make it accessible because as much as digital work is makes things accessible, not everybody works digitally mm. um, or finds it user-friendly a lot of the time. So it's, I guess it's finding a gallery that works as as user friendly as possible as well. Mm. Um, so I think that's about, mm, so sorry to interrupt you. Um, it just in terms, obviously, we've met Jarvis. We've heard a little bit about his work, and also you can see his work on the viewing room. But how many artists did you invite to be part of the project? Um, I've invited twelve, um, and I think they are reflective of a diverse range of ideas. Um, the title itself that was given to the exhibition of somewhere between um, reality and obscurity. So there was very much a consideration of, I'm not trying to hone in on one way of thinking or one way of showing I, an idea. I didn't have a set idea. I wanted to do a show that is almost quite retrospective of the world we're living in today. Um, and I think that's justified in those 12 artists and the way that they work not not one artist is working in the same way. Mm. So I think I was quite mindful of how a digital show still has curiosity um, in the way that you might want to find out about each person. Um, and I think we did a lot of work, you know, some of the barriers of digital work and timeframes, I think in all credit to UKNA in, in this particular thing, I think it's actually a very good example of a digital exhibition. And I think, you know, you as a, a team back end and Ronan Somerville who helped design the gallery I think there was a lot of work on how it feels as tangible as possible mm -hmm. and as natural as possible in the way that you can navigate a gallery space rather than I guess trying to do a bells and whistles showing off of digital technology I don't think that was necessary in this regard so it still felt warm as an experience or it's still it's still on now so obviously yeah. look at it um so but yeah it's there's a there's a level of different languages happening in all of those works and there's different textures which sometimes is hard to put across in a digital show mm. but i think we did a lot of work in terms of how we can try and humanize the experience so you know a curate a curator statement so that you can read from, from my mindset of how I was trying to imagine this show, there's a lot of content for each artist's work when you click on their works as well. So it feels that we're trying to do as much as possible in the way that an institution or a gallery might have an engagement programme in the way that you can access work. I think we've tried to be mindful of it operating in the same way that a physical show would. Mm -hmm. So, um, Jarvis, have you had your work in a digital gallery or a digital space before have you had an opportunity to see your work in that context was this the first time this is the first time and i really want to um say actually i think the way in which this digital exhibition has been put together is a step in a better direction i feel like um so to answer your question is no, I haven't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not there. Um, but I've had it in the sense where images are put on a website. 
you know and but i feel like in creating this space the digital space and you know when you can move you can move through it just you know clicking parts of it which kind of feels like google earth in a way you can just move through it and there is this sense of fluidity um with the experience of um, a digital gallery i think um I don't know if I've gone off on a ramble, but I think it's great. What That's good. Yeah, you guys ramble away because I was just interested to kind of hear from an artist's perspective. Yeah. You know, what is it like? You know, we're in this new world. <clears throat> there are mm. lots of people kind of doing this work. <clears throat> Pardon me. And you know, as an artist, how does it feel? Because you didn't, yeah. I suspect you didn't imagine you'd want, you know, you'd want people to see and enjoy your work in this way, perhaps initially. You know, the reality is probably, you know, better. But yeah. how does I it think, feel to be in that space? I suppose. <clears throat> I think, I think at the minute it's very, it's very new. You know, it has a lot of room for potential. It's something which I've been thinking about, like going forward. It, nothing will ever replace a physical space. Nothing will, because you can't see, you know, the subtleties, for example, in things, or you can't see the subtleties of like, um, you know, objects within a space. You can't, it's, it's not quite there yet. Um, but at that minute, it feels like a healthy step in the right direction. And I can envisage a future that combines the two, for, say, people who can't travel to London or to Tokyo or to New York, LA. Um, yeah, there's, there's huge potential in this, like, you know, scanning works on a, on a level, you know, when, say, for example, um, scanning uh, hardware becomes more accessible to consumers that could potentially pick up on the, the three-dimensionality of a surface and then how that could then translate into VR. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a kind of interesting development. I mean, we've had a lot of very positive feedback. Um, it, it has been open um, to our kind of uh, guests. Um, it will be open to the public later today. Um, but we had had a lot of feedback about the kind of presentation and you know how it feels like a step in the right direction from maybe some of the other. You know, we built on we're probably walking along where others have trod and kind of developed from there. <clears throat> So a question for both of you. I'm going to start with Jarvis because you were sort of threading through that. <clears throat> what do you think is the future of digital galleries? So, I, yeah, I kind of like touched on that briefly. I think, I think the future is, like I said, as technology becomes uh, more affordable for the consumer in terms of like advanced technology. So finding ways of artists um, being able to scan work. Through the, I mean, they already have 3D sc scanning um, uh, hardware. Available. It's very expensive, though. They did it with um, the northern Chinese grottos. Okay. So they, they basically scanned these grottos, which they want to prevent people from going into to preserve them, and then recreated them in a physical sense. But I could imagine that being created in a digital sense in which you can safely because vr is still a bit crazy you know like within a safe space and look around and um be able to somehow engage with the work physically you know there's a film called ready player one in which they kind of allude to that i don't know how far in the future that is but that would be exciting to see that again for those people who can't yeah. Come to okay, Tokyo, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. Garth, what do you think is the future of digital galleries? Would you do it again? <laughs> um, well, without sounding like an, a, a work whore, I'll do any job. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'll take the challenge and run with it as long <laughs> as it's platforming young and emerging artists with a level of ethics and morals. So, yeah, I think for me, um, I guess there's there's always a it's a dichotomy, isn't it? It's a double edged sword. It's positive and negative. And I think as long as we're always mindful of that, we'll make good digital showcases. Um, I think they're a great way of helping you out of a creative rut, which we've all experienced this year. I think they're useful for stay at home inspiration or for a kind of an art fix when you have a super tight schedule. 
So things that you can access and dip in and out of, I think they 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 put serve a purpose in that regard. Um, for me, it's about how they wet your whistle for engaging in real life. So not trying to compete or take away from a real life experience. Um, but I guess how you can enhance the invitation to go and look at art in real life. Yeah. Uh, I think is something I'm interested in digital showcasing. Mm -hmm. um, because I think yeah. there's so much work to do around arts practice and understanding artists and how they work, which you can't necessarily translate without speaking to them or providing a platform to let them speak, which then inevitably builds those, that artist's confidence and ability to communicate their ideas as well. Um, and I think there's something about how we're encouraging through digital means physical interactions with galleries, with artist studios and project spaces and things that inhabit town and city centres. So, you know, how things come come to an invitation to engage with Leicester, for example, as a city mm. rather than Leicester as a digital community. Um, so it should always promote an ongoing need to interact with cultural venues and wider high streets and social cultures because I think we, as much as we work in isolation as artists, we need social interaction and you know, a level of stroking our ego every now and again by meeting each other and finding those peers and advocating for each other in real life as well. Mm -hmm. um, the, the viewing room is a selling platform. Again, this is a, a, a new venture for us. Um, <clears throat> we also felt it was important rather than just having a simple presentation to offer, you know, in these difficult times, the opportunity for work to be bought. Um, I think for me, in terms of the future of digital galleries, the role of the consumer within digital galleries is an interesting one. I'm kind of interested to see how this test goes. And we have sold work already, um, but sort of how are people kind of interacting with that? How are they, how comfortable are they with kind of buying something which perhaps they haven't seen? Um, and, and when it's, and when it's, when it's art, you know, it's not a, you know, a, a brown jumper off ASOS when you've got a fairly good idea what's going to pop in the post to you, you know. So I think that's a dimension I'm kind of keen to sort of see how that manifests itself and and what that might look like. So that will be kind of interesting. So another question to the both of you, <clears throat> and again, we'll start with Jarvis. <clears throat> I do apologise. What's been the biggest learning curve of doing this project, The Viewing Room? I guess the biggest learning curve for me is because I'm quite early in my journey as an artist, it's just, you know, contracts, for example like being introduced contracts and it's it's quite exciting for me actually i enjoy the back and forth i enjoy kind of like you know i don't know how many emails i sent to god i don't think it was too many but i enjoyed that um you know just kind of like thinking about because initially i'm very enthusiastic with things and um it was it was good actually to to initially put things in and then think about it. Oh wait a minute, let me make some adjustments. And so that going back and forth that's yeah. been like a learning curve for me. Uh, it's new to me. Um, and off the top of my head, that's all I can think of at the minute. Yeah. No, I think that's that's a really interesting point because. You know, I think when you're just starting out, there's lots of things which surround the what appears to be the mm. simple presentation of work, whether that be in real mm. life or digitally, that you have to consider. And mm -hmm. for many emerging artists, they haven't had to consider that yet. Um, so, you know, it can be an interesting journey to go on. Yeah. And it's good, you know, that's part of the process. That's part about, mm -hmm. you know, growing as a professional artist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Garth, uh, I embrace that. I mean, I'm oh, yeah. sorry to interrupt. No, 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 I embrace that. And just in learning, <coughs> there's a few books out at the minute. There's one that was put out by Delphian Gallery, and there's another one called Art Slash Work. Um, and it's just something which we've been learning about, and like, I'm open to embracing that whole it, you know, business aspect of what it means to be an artist as opposed to kind of freaking out when, you know, contracts come in. It's like, yeah. how can I address them? How can I um, 
be efficient and effective, right? You know, so, yeah. Mm. No, thank you. And Garth, what's been your biggest learning curve of doing the viewing room? I think there's learning about how layered the process of developing a digital show is. I think there's a lot of a time, a lot of the time we, we assume digital is a faster, quicker, maybe more efficient, cheaper way of doing something. And actually to do it well, it's, it's as time consuming, as in detail, as developing an exhibition in real life. Um, but they have different outcomes and experiences. Um, and then you have to mindfully think about how people are having that experience when you aren't tangibly seeing them arrive. You know, they're clicking in in their own time in isolation or in, in not or not in isolation. So you're not really sure how you're holding an audience or how they're engaging. Mm -hmm. So there's something about trusting that it's working because you can't necessarily see if it's working because a lot of that's back end and not people. It's codes. It's the system. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of thinking through just when you open the gallery, when you click on each painting, what pops up. You know, it's it's a space on top of a space on top of a space. And all of those things have to be thought through and yeah. designed. Um, and, you know, as a curator, sometimes you have the joy of flippantly walking in and looking at 20 paintings and go, I just want them there in a perfect <laughs> way. And then a, a designer doing coding goes, well, I need to type all of that in, la, 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 la. And it's like, oh, right, OK. Well, can you not just do it now? <laughs> um, so, yeah, some learning around patience um, <laughs> with digital Patience with something that's not your skill set and also learning to let go that it's not your skill set and that's mm. all right. You know, I've got many other ones. I don't have to claim coding as a skill as well. That's what other people and their specialisms. Yeah. So it's certainly been a nice exercise in collaborating for sure. Um, but I think there's some reality of, you know, in an ideal world with digital showcases, you'd like more collective conversations with the artists, you know, as a curator, you always want to indulge in that element of putting a show on. But, you know, ironically, liaising with artists is, is a percentage of putting a show on. It's not actually the only thing you have to do. Um, so, yeah, more of that would be lovely, as I'm sure artists would enjoy more interaction with curators and vice versa. Because mm. I think it's about what is good about the digital platform is how often you could have that interaction between peers. Um, and I think for me, it's, again, to have been involved in something that started from nothing into something is always something I love to do. So that continued learning for me of that's what I like to do. It's been a challenge, but it was nothing and now it's something. Yeah. And then it's nice to think that that gallery could carry on for another group of artists or another emergent curator who wants to test that space with art in it. So I feel like there's a host venue now that's existing out there for somebody. Mm. So I quite, I quite like that idea that we've, mm. we've, we've made that happen. Mm. No, I mean, I think we should all be very proud of our roles, you know, as artists, as curators, as kind of host, um, you know, to create it a kind of new space where work can be seen. Um, I think it's interesting the point that you make, Garth, about time. I wonder whether if somebody was thinking about doing this, whether they would assume that this was quicker than doing a real real gallery, a real, um, you know, in real life thing, um, I would probably say not. <laughs> um, you know, now we've done it, we've done it for the first time, so I expect, you know, everything we did had to be done for the first time and thought about and, you know... <clears throat> Even, for example, when Jarvis is talking about the contracts, how the hell do you have a contract for a digital gallery? You know, what do we need to say? What do they need to think about? Everything felt like a kind of naught position. Now that we have it, I'll be interested to see what we do with it and how we use it and what the next iteration will be. Um, but certainly the kind of time and money, you know, it is not... Um, it is no cheaper. It's probably a bit more expensive than putting on a real a real show. So I think these are sort of some of the considerations which perhaps looking from the outside, oh, you know, we can't, because of COVID, we can't put on an exhibition, so let's do this, is, is very worthy, but it's as challenging, as time-consuming, and as expensive as it would be to 
you know, put on an in real life show, except you don't have the fun of having a PV and getting slightly tipsy. That was, that's the negative, <laughs> you know, there's no gatherings. That's the kind of, although it's, as you described it, a very human space, but that you kind of miss that, that kind of sense of belonging and being part of something and sharing that. Um, but maybe we'll, over the coming weeks, kind of look and see what that looks like. So the last question to both of you is, and again, we're going to start with Jarvis, is what does 2021, hold, what, is it, what, is, what does it look like? Hopefully very good, but what does it kind of hold for you? What are the kind of next steps for you, Jarvis? Continue being a hermit? Yeah, no, not really. Um, <laughs> I'm, really I'm really interested in murals. I'm really interested oh. in creating murals. So... Um, I have some plans for that, but not concrete plans, just kind of like working things out um, and just continue doing my best, really continue making as much work as possible, um, but definitely taking more time, um, giving more of myself to the work rather than feeling the kind of pressure of social media or whatever to churn out as much as possible. Um yeah, there's some there's some healthy things in in the pipeline. Um, kind of being obscure, mister, mysterious at the minute, but um, yeah, I feel very positive about 2021, and I'm hoping that you know, kind of COVID restrictions change, so, can, so we can you know start seeing humans and hugging again, and you know, um, you know, having awkward conversations, and you know, all of that good <laughs> stuff. You know, being human, so. Yeah, it, I'm very positive about 21. And Garth? Uh, I'm just going to up my dating game, I think, and just... Ooh. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I think there's quite a lot, or there's lots of theory things that are awaiting funding at the moment. For Obviously, I run a studio here as a business, so we apply for funding every year. Your Arts Council, if you're listening, um, look forward to receiving that in 2021. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there's lots of that. If we get that, then that's a whole annual program and packages of support for artists and residencies and commissions, um, which feeds into research at the moment that I'm doing as an artist, which is around developing a new seaside and curators network for people living in the coast. Um, you know, that's a unique part of the UK's culture. So I'm kind of curious to look at how that is connecting with itself a bit more moving forwards. Um, and I guess starting to say I'm an artist who guest curates is is just a slight subtle change for me of I make my work, I always have. Um, well, I guess a lot of my professional output is curatorial. Um, you know, you've got to balance the books at the end of the year, haven't you? Mm -hmm. So but for me, I am an artist and then my skills as an artist get invited to curate shows because that's part of my passion is about bringing materials together and people together. So. I'm kind of curious about my own professional output next year. And I'm on a program called Pivot at the moment, supported by... The, the TV program. It makes it sound like a TV program. Um, Pivot. On BBC uh, One at nine o'clock. <laughs> or like a TV <laughs> presenter. Um, <laughs> I'm on Pivot, which is supported by the Blue Coat in Liverpool and Castlefield Gallery in Manchester. So that's 18 months which will just see where that takes me, which is mm. quite exciting. And just to breathe into that for now. Perfect. Well, also, just um, for those of you who are listening, and if you head to our website, you will be able to see some examples of Garth's work, which is also for sale. Um, alongside the viewing room, we have the Robert Walters collection. Um, we are very grateful to the Robert Walters group for their support and sponsorship of emerging artists. And last year, that we had uh, we launched a prize with them. Um, um, which was a significant investment in the work of emerging talent in this country um, of fifteen thousand pounds that was direct funding but they um, that they supported artists in a 
much wider way as well. Um, and um, we're showing some examples of um, some of the shortlisted artists and the winners, Connor Rogers and Camilla Hanney. So again, that's available to see um, on our website as well as Garth's work. Um, I'd also like to thank the Arts Council England for their continued support of UK new artists and to the four universities who also support us and recognise the importance of um, you know, new talent, emerging talent in this country, which is De Montford University in Leicester, uh, the University of Derby, the University of Lincoln and Nottingham Trent University, um, who've all been amazing in supporting talented young individuals across all art forms. So um, thank you to those guys. So are there any last pearls of wisdom, Garth, Jarvis, that you want to impart to our audience? Jarvis. <laughs> <laughs> it's some time to think, Garth. You go ahead. You go first. I'm going to pass the ball your way. Um. Yeah, I think I, I always tend to sound like some northern ranter, but I think in I tend to make work out of frustration or response to things. So I think as artists, if you're feeling that you are frustrated or limited or with a lack of support or resource at the moment, work through that, answer those questions and find the people that can help you figure that out. Don't just accept that that's a stop for you. Um, don't accept the notions of being told to retrain because um, I think yes. we, we've done enough training um, and we already support ourselves by secondary or, or three jobs in a in a row. So keep doing you. Um, and it's just a little crap year and it'll be better next year. And there'll be more opportunities through this and anyway. And we'll keep working together to make more platforms for young artists. So watch this space. Perfect. That's a wonderful note to end on. And anybody who's interested in Garth's work and studios, it's Abingdon Studios in Blackpool. So just do a search on that um, and you'll find out some more information about that work. And obviously, artist staff is Brookfield. Again, do a search and you will come across a wonderful website and see some more example of Jarvis's work. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you both very much. <gasps> Garth! Don't let Jarvis get away with it. I, He's not <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I did, didn't I? I did. Oh, well spotted, Garth. Okay. He's put you right on the spot now. He's no, put you good. right I'm, on the I'm spot, ready. Jarvis. I'm prepared, okay? So oh. are you ready for this? Okay, come on then. It's a poem. It's a poem. <laughs> oh. We need the stress of conflict and the harmony of resolution in order to feel the fullness of life. And that's a poem by John Keats. And I think it's kind of fitting for the times in that despite the difficulties that we all face, um, there are sunny moments in life too. So. Perfect. Thank you. So he, you, you know, he's usurped you now, Garth. That was just like um. ultimate, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Listen, I really, really appreciate the time you've both taken to share your thoughts about the viewing room, um, you know, where this kind of visual art sits digitally and how we maneuver this kind of new space. So I hope people have found it interesting. Please go and have a look. Please check out all the work that's on amazing artists um, and again just thank you very very much